Last weekend, I rented the Canon R6. I'm filming on it right now. I wanna share my impressions on using it, specifically for video. Let's go. As we take a look at the video capabilities of the R6, let's break it into three categories. What do we know about the R6? What I experienced with the R6? And takeaways and suggestions for optimizing performance with the camera. You're a beautiful person and a good person. And if no one has told you that today, let me be the first one to tell you that. I had the good fortune to have a couple opportunities to put the camera through its paces on Friday and Saturday, filming a one of a kind event known as a blind photo day. The blind photo day is the creation of photographer Will Utley. I featured him on the channel here before and uh, he invited two strangers to a picnic on the beach where they meet each other for the first time, have a romantic picnic and a photo shoot. I was there to document the event to help publicize upcoming events in the series. The next day we repeated the same type of experience but inside Will's photo studio space. What do we know about video on the Canon R6? It's running the Digic X image processor, uses oversampled UHD 4K recording at 60 frames per second, full HD 1080p recording at 60 frames per second, and full HD high frame rate recording at up to 120 frames per second. Canon touts it as being for the video creator and being flexible. We know it does internal 422 10-bit H265 Canon log recording. That's a mouthful. Canon claims the EOS R6 is capable of capturing confidently even during challenging high contrast exposure situations. So let's look at some footage I captured Friday at the beach. This was right near the Belmont Pier in Long Beach. We had the intensity of the setting Southern California beach sunset to compete with and balance and I was filming at 60 frames per second using a variable ND filter from Tiffin so that I could cut that light and have my shutter speed at 1 over 120. The footage looks great, it's crisp, lots of detail in the shadows and the highlights. In Final Cut, it's easy to pull the highlights down and manage the footage. I don't claim to be a great color grade expert, uh, but this footage is a joy to work with. There's tons of data from the 10-bit files uh, to work with. The 10 bit files capture tons of color data, even in the highlights. The oversampled UHD 4K 422 10 bit video signal at 60 frames per second can be output from the HDMI port to a picture style, Canon Log, or HDR PQ format, and the output, output can be recorded into another device externally, or the footage can be viewed on an HDR PQ compatible TV. However, I did not run any HDMI out tests. I was recording internally 10-bit 422. My first goal was just testing 4K 60 frames per second footage and I knew I could get the 10-bit uh, files and those gave me a couple of realizations. As simple as it seems, uncropped 4K was the first realization. Seems simple, seems basic, 4K footage without a crop. Now I'm used to using the 4K on the EOS R which I actually avoid because of the crop and two reasons for that. I have to be mindful of the difference be what, between what I think a lens can give me in terms of framing and composition and what the crop produces. And two, many times I'm filming inside and the crop means I don't have room because of the furniture or the walls. And so I don't have the room I want to make the best use of my lens to film in 4K. So now that I have experienced uncrop 4K, I don't wanna go back. Second, the 4K footage, is better than the 1080p footage hands down. I edit on a 5K LG monitor. I could tell the difference between the 4K and the 1080p footage every single time just at a glance. The 4K is sharper, crisper, more contrasty and punchier. It has more data to give to the bigger monitor and it seems I could tell the difference. Now, not all 4K footage is created equal. I could put the Sony RX100 6 up next to the R6 4K footage. And there's a couple of hundred megabits difference in the bit rate. So the Sony footage doesn't hold up. It's 4K, but not as crisp, sharp, and full of useful image data. This leads me to my next goal. My second goal is testing the video in 120 frames per second HD footage. I've used the EOS R right there in 720p 120, but two problems stand out, lack of autofocus and a lack of a punchy image. So that could be complicated or exacerbated by the lack of the autofocus, of course. Whenever I use the EOS R 120 frames per second footage, I did not nail the focus. It's my fault, it's hard to do, I didn't put a lot of time practicing into it, but it eluded me. Here's something we know about the R6 in contrast, and this is paraphrased from the Canon website. 
The Digic X processor uses deep learning artificial intelligence to recognize and track a subject's eyes, face, head, and body. So what does that mean? People are kept sharp even if there's one eye in the frame or they turn profile. The EOS R6 tracks their head so that when they look back at the camera, their eye snaps back into focus like that. So with the R6, nailing focus is simple. Turn it on and go. Now a tip I found is that while I'm tracking moving subjects, if they were dead on, straight on, and the eye autofocus was solid, However, if I asked subjects to turn away and come at me or spin and I was tracking a particular part of their body and movement, like think of shoes going down the pavement and the eye autofocus was not the best mode. Actually, my advice is to experiment with that. I found the area focus worked better and uh, was more flexible in tracking these shots where the eye was not in the frame. Another issue is that in low light, though the Canon website says the light of a quarter moon is enough to trigger eye autofocus, I found in the second scene, which was a dimly lit living room, actually Will's photo studio set up that way, eye autofocus wasn't reliable. Now I believe Canon's talking about if your subject is in quarter moon strength light and is facing directly toward the light source and the camera is facing directly at the subject, eye autofocus was good. But if the light source wasn't direct, it's not gonna work as great as you would hope. So in the second scene, the light was coming from the side in my situation, the light wasn't always direct enough or strong enough to trigger the eye autofocus. But if I had to estimate, I would say that the eye autofocus works about 85 to 90% of the time. And you know what? I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. It was pretty money in low light situations. I rented the Canon R6 so I could experience it for myself and also to be better informed to share information on this channel. My main goal was to better understand the difference between the EOS R and the R6, which I'm filming on right now. Let's turn to the top suggestions I have for optimizing performance with this camera takeaways I got from my time with the R6. Shoot it 120 frames per second. It's an absolute joy. For the type of promo videos I was creating, I could use this all day long. Next, use a sharpening filter on that slow motion footage to make it a little crispier. Next, crank the contrast on your color grade. The 10-bit files can handle it. Also, I found I would rather overexpose and bring the shadows down when color correcting, and I felt the overexposed footage did better than shooting dark and bumping it up. Shoot in 4K. You will love the crispy footage you get. 100% of the time, I would use this over the EOS R. Pairing the great RF lenses with the 4K footage and 10-bit C-Log was amazing. My final takeaway is really, I wanna try the R5 so that that 120 frames per second footage I get is consistent with the 4K. I don't wanna scale up the 120 frames per second and then have to notice the difference between the 60 and the 120. I could definitely tell the difference between the 8-bit 4K files of the EOS R and the 10-bit 4K files. For the price point, $24.99 versus $17.99 for the R, I would definitely, definitely suggest and recommend the R6. I feel like the R6 is a significant step forward in quality, ease of use, and I'm really hungry to try the R5. For the price point, $24.99 versus $38.99 for the R5, I would definitely recommend the R6. Thank you for joining me. I'm so glad you stopped by the channel. If it's your first time, please take a minute to subscribe. Leave me a comment. Let me know what you think of these cameras, and I'll see you in the next video. Peace.